Hello and welcome back to Talking Leadership TV. Our guest today is Rachel Waterhouse. Rachel is the CEO of the Australian Shareholders Association. She brings 20 years of business leadership experience within industry and professional associations as well as the financial services sector. She has a background in digital and traditional communications, media marketing, sales, partnerships, product management and events. She's implemented effective organizational strategies and coached various teams to excellence. She's had key roles in Cuscal, St. George Bank, the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the Governance Institute of Australia. All of these roles have culminated in her understanding the importance of careful investment as well as good governance. Rachel has a Master's in Business Administration, a Graduate Diploma of Applied Corporate Governance and Risk Management and a Bachelor of Business. She is also a Fellow of the Governance Institute of Australia. I know you'll enjoy this podcast. Thank you for joining us and supporting the great work that we do here, which is always only made possible by our guests. But enough from me, I'll hand over to Rachel. Rachel, thank you for joining me. Let's start at the beginning in terms of your leadership pathway. So where did that begin for you? Yeah, when I was about 15, I started working at Video Easy, then Toys R Us, and I was a cashier. And then I moved into supervising other people, which was really interesting. And I guess that's when I first started learning about what being a leader is and about the diversity of the people you work with as well. So from there, I went on to study at university and then move into marketing and product management in finance and then into association world, where I'm now the CEO of Australian Shareholders Association. Uh, that's, a, that's a great progression. I I was, um, you, you took me back when you said video easy. That's going back to a time where we used to rent videos. We don't, we don't do that too much anymore, but um, yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. So on on your journey through, did you have any idea that you'd end up in the CEO role you had now, or was it a, a sequence of unrelated events that got you there? Or what, what was the formula? What was there a formula for you to get to where you got to? Uh- my mother reminds me of this when I went to a party at the age of 21 you had to dress up as who you wanted to be in the future and at that point in time I wanted to be the CEO of Coca-Cola so um, I'm not sure if that led me to where I am but it's good to have a goal when when you're younger but I guess you fall into it is the real answer is you know you do one thing and then you move into it, take an opportunity as it comes towards you so work really hard do what's expected and keep on thinking about what could my future involve i always knew i wanted to be a manager and a leader um but where and you know how i, d- I didn't have all of the answers when i started out and and that's good to know and and i don't think anyone really has the answers but i'm I'm glad you aim for the lofty heights of CEO of Coca-Cola. Um, maybe you could be aiming higher. I don't know if it gets much <laughs> higher than that. Um, yeah, the, and that, that, um, that I guess is what I'm hearing, not what I guess, what I know I'm hearing from previous guests is that there's some formula to it, but sometimes it's just a random set of circumstances when you can move up in the world, particularly when you're looking for leadership roles. So, Rachel, can I ask, how do you define leadership? Okay, so I define when I studied, I actually went into all the technical, what's a leader, what's a manager. Um, but what I believe a leader is, is it's someone you can trust. It's someone that you can follow that makes really good decisions, which then helps empower everyone around to make good decisions and grow and learn in their role. So I think a leader is around supporting everyone that you're working with recognizing that people are different and helping them on their journey in leadership, whether that's to manage a team or just to be fantastic at what they do. Yeah, that again, that's also consistent with the role of leadership being around decision-making. It's not always just about that, but key focus of being the leader is you're the one that needs to make the final decision and about the people. And um, I like the word empowering the people around you, which is what you're you're getting at. Um, can I just just to dig into the weeds a little, if I could? When when you started to realise that you were on that leadership pathway, did the fact that you had to manage other human beings was that a daunting thing for you, or were you ready for that, or some somewhere in between? 
Oh, I don't think anyone's ready for it when you do step up is the, is the answer because, and it, and it depends where you are in your career pathway and potentially your age as well. But um, you're dealing with human beings are complex. We're all complex. There's not always a right or a wrong answer. And as you develop your leadership, it's around working with the strengths of the people around you. So a leader is not someone that has all the answers. There's someone that works with others to make sure that you have the best answer you can or make the best decision you can. As a leader, then that means that you want to have the right people around you because you want to have those people that are going to make good decisions as part of a team. But everyone has their own strengths. Um, so, you know, people are amazing. Um, it's really different from working with numbers, but it also brings you the greatest joy as well, being being a leader and seeing what people can do and how they develop over time. As, as an extension, and, and thank you for that, as an extension to the previous question, do you hold any particular set of leader capabilities as critical for effective leadership from your experiences, Rachel? Well, I, I do think someone that needs to be really curious in life, like so as far as at work and at home, curious as far as what could the answer be? How can I support this person? Uh, what's the best decision potentially for the organisation? So you definitely need to be really curious. You need to be trustworthy. So you need to make good decisions. You need to make the right decision that other people would think was, was ethical and live by values and have people around you that have the same values so that you're heading in the right direction. I, I think that's important because a lot of people think that a business performance is just around achieving the goals, but potentially people can achieve business outcomes, but do it the wrong way. So you need to do it the right way. I think that's really clear having worked in the organizations I have, but also doing a lot of study on on governance. And it really is about doing things the right way. Yeah, there's definitely a, a, a process mix there. And, and when, when people have talked to me previously around the leadership process, there are some formulas, I guess, out there that you can use, but you also need to adapt it to your own circumstances. And, and there's never a one size fits all of, of I'm constantly being surprised by my guests where there's slight uh, variations on the theme around what the leadership process is or what leadership means to them personally. And, and you've outlined that quite well. Let me ask you to um, maybe shift your mind a little bit still on the leadership topic, but looking at a uh, post COVID or coming out of that COVID world, what, what in your estimation, so I'll make this a two parter, do you think from your experiences that leaders were challenged through the COVID-19 pandemic sort of at the start and, and through the, the guts of it from what you've seen? And then the second part to that is, do you think there are going to be longer term implications that we're yet to see as a result of, of COVID in terms of the leadership process? Yeah, I think everyone was challenged through COVID, employees and leaders. Uh, it was a lot of change. It was unexpected change and you had to quickly adapt and you had to also rely on technology. So you had, you know, all of us were remote wherever you were and looking after the mental health of, of your staff was really important. And it is very important going forward. And it's great that there's more of a focus on mental health and how organisations can support everyone that works in them. Um, I guess it depends on your leadership. So if you were a leader that needed to look over and see someone was there and they turned up at nine and, you know, they left at a certain time, then you would have been in great shock with COVID because you couldn't do those things in any way anymore. Um, but what we've learned from there, I would say, is you need to trust employees. They did the job. They did it for two years. Most employees did it really well. So they can be trusted to work from home. The other one is you need to recognise that there's such a low unemployment rate here in Australia that you want the best employees. And employees are saying that they want to work from home a certain number of days a week. So to have the best employees, be flexible. So a leader needs to be flexible, but they also need to be really clear on their expectations. So how a staff member does it 
is really up to them as long as they're delivering and just all organisations to really do what they can around mental health for staff. Yeah, I, I would be fascinated to find out just how many leaders in positions like yours and others are actually um, having these conversations or thinking about letting go of traditional models of work because um, I, I don't think I'm, I'm saying anything groundbreaking here by noting that in some industries it's going to be more difficult to have the work from home scenario than have the traditional you have to be uh, on the work side and I'm thinking here in some uh, some element of the manufacturing sector mm -hmm. the medical profession nursing you can't necessarily do it from home and so um, having that conversation around what do future work models look like or how employees and your teams will interact in the workspace I think is going to be a, a good opportunity for leaders to rethink some of these things, but I also reckon there's going to be some huge headaches coming yeah. along the way. And um, I'd just like to ask you if I could, do you think, I'll take that one back, I think, from your experiences in the leadership circles that you move through, do you think this is being given enough attention or is it a source of irritation or some combination of those things? I think it's a combination. I think it depends on the expectations of an organisation, of the employees. What you picked up on is a really valid point, is not, not all jobs can be flexible, not all jobs can be done from home. And um, that's a consideration for businesses. I, I have heard of a company that's more into the manufacturing area talking about how they can have flexibility as far as people can come onto a site and they work a certain number of hours rather than a full day so that they can drop kids at school, pick them up from school. But the conversation, as you, you mentioned, is around, well, what is that flexibility and what works for the business and what works for the employee? So that's that's where it's got to be. There's got to have be a conversation. I mean, I do hear uh, some people talking about, oh, I've got to be back in the office now four or five days a week or whatever that looks like. And those organisations may be at risk of losing staff. So, you know, take the benefits of what we learnt during COVID that did work for organisations and leaders and apply that to now to keep the talent. Yeah, I agree. I wonder, though, how much of a shock COVID was that some businesses adapted only to do that out of necessity and then go back to old models of working because that's... Uh, the path of least resistance. I, I, I fully understand and, and you've made the, the point that um, change, I guess, is is going to be something that we need to grapple with. And it's not, it, it's not, again, I'm not making an observation that people don't get, but when you don't like certain changes that are going to have a negative impact, you change is bad, but when mm. the change is good, you're all for it. And so yeah. I, I think um, it, it there has to be a conversation and some degree of give from both the employee and the employer because one set of conversations I've had in the lead up to our chat today is it's an employee's market at the moment but when that changes and it's harder to find work um, the attitude that you need to just adjust to me because I'm coming in and, and you need to value me as a potential new hire that'll, mm -hmm. only, that'll only last for a certain amount of time and then companies will get a lot more um particular about the kind of people they want to recruit so I, I guess there's some fruitful discussions there and it, it I, I get the impression that you've been having at least some of those conversations with your uh, contemporaries look um mm. but before we get off this particular topic and again it's around working with teams what value do you think or what value is probably not the right term what what lessons do you do you think were learned by leaders post-COVID around the management of their teams? Yeah, I, I think it's around what technologies you need to be able to work with your teams because I was in an organisation where we were fortunate that we'd shifted a lot of our technical solutions around the time COVID happened. So it was just a matter of getting everyone's computers to their house and making sure they knew how to use those systems. Uh, but 
it really is back to that trust because there are conversations happening in businesses around how can we ensure people are on their computer and how can we ensure they are working certain hours uh, you need to trust your employees now if for some reason you are seeing something that indicates that they're not trust trusted to do it then you need to have a conversation so like most things, it comes down to conversations. Uh, but I think there's been a lot learned. And I really hope that leaders don't forget those lessons that they learned during COVID and can continue to apply them as far as it's okay for your employees to do what they do when it works for them, if it works for the business. Um, and then just, yeah, I think that's the main thing is just really work well together in a collaborative way to achieve the business outcomes Words of wisdom there. Let me uh, ask you then from your experiences of leadership, are leaders born or are they made? Well, that's another interesting question. I guess when I when I was growing up, I thought you see things in the media and I thought they're made, leaders are made. A lot of the things that you see around, you know, leaders that have achieved great things by certain ages. But I actually think that it's, it's, both so it's either made but if you don't cons consistently learn and develop you as far as I'm concerned you're not a leader so you need to keep on learning and that's through seeing what others do thinking what might apply uh, asking for feedback being brave and courageous and asking for feedback will make the biggest difference in your leadership journey because then you can hear from other people what they think about you and what you could do differently rather than reading a book or reading an article about how to be the best leader. I mean, there's a lot of books on it, but ultimately it's around how you're performing as a leader and getting feedback. Yeah, couldn't couldn't disagree with that. Let me ask you if you could go back to a younger version of yourself to impart some wisdom about how to be a more effective leader, what would you say to a younger version of Rachel? I would say don't follow others blindly. So it's around being really curious and thinking about what should I be as a leader? What works in this organisation? Because your leadership journey is going to change over time and, and you really hope it does. So um, I think that's it. Like sometimes you might think someone is a leader, but then you look back on it and go, oh, I don't think they were a leader and maybe I shouldn't have done X, Y, Z. So, um, yeah, just and that comes with experience and, and age. But, yeah, just keep on questioning it. What's the right leader? Who am I? And I had a leader once that actually talked work from the heart, not from the head. So I think it's a combination. But when making really tough decisions, I've always thought about what that leader told me. And I think what's happening in the heart, because we often go into facts, data, information that we perceive ourselves. Uh, but how are you making a decision with heart? I'd like to thank Rachel for her time and sharing her leadership pathway with us. If you can, please drop a like on this podcast if you are enjoying the content or if you can help us grow the channel, please subscribe. Have a great day, rest of the week, and we'll catch everyone on the next episode of Talking Leadership TV.